the, uh, the strategic plan that we had developed was very much based on what my predecessor, Dr. Mary Gosmodere, which had de developed uh, a few years ago. So the mission has remained the same, which is to advance exemplary radiation medicine through patient care, research, and education in partnership with our patients and our community. Our vision has been revised to three very simple phrases, precision radiation medicine, personalized care, and global impact. And the strategic priorities are precision medicine, integrate research and education with clinical practice, strengthen community linkages, and high reliability with systems thinking. And this is in everything that we do, we're guided and uh, based and anchored on our core values of innovation, excellence, collaboration, accountability, and integrity. <coughs> So let me just go through each of these core values in a little bit more detail. What does it mean to be innovative? That means that we are creative, bold, and passionate in the pursuit and implementation of new ideas that will improve patient, cancer patient outcomes. Excellence. We demonstrate dedication and focused commitment while leading with respect and civility at the individual, team, and program levels. Collaborate. We engage meaningfully and inclusively with each other beyond the traditional practice domains and program boundaries to achieve more together than <coughs> apart. Accountability. We step forward with a sense of empowerment, personal drive, focus, and commitment. We're highly accountable to ourselves, colleagues, team members, partners, and funders, our taxpayers, and our donors. Integrity, we conduct ourselves in a fair, transparent, and ethical manner at all times. We are highly reliable, and we are consistently sincere and trustworthy. <coughs> so those are our core values that will define how we practice every single day. So again, the strategic priorities, precision medicine, integrate research education into clinical practice, strengthen community linkages, and extend high reliability with systems thinking. So before I launch into a little bit deeper descriptions of our, each of our strategic priorities, I'd like to take us through some of the review of our 2015, and then after the strategic priorities, just very described part of that is how we're thinking about what that future might look like and a few quick concluding remarks. So it always gives me great pleasure when I'm presenting these rounds here once a year on, on honoring uh, the achievements that we've had over the years because, of course, we are very fortunate in that regard. And so one of the most important achievements, of course, which define our fundamental practice is that we had delivered the highest number of radiation courses over the past fiscal year, uh, and this is the highest number over the decade of 10,383 courses. Um, and our numbers are continuing to be slowly creeping up uh, year after year. Um, and of course, every April, we have our celebration lunch, uh, which is attended by more than 200 people, uh, including our partners from the foundation and uh, other members of our senior management uh, team. Um, and of course, we also uh, give people uh, stress balls. So last year, we had star-shaped uh, balls, and this year, it's a little bit different. You know, you can still squeeze them, but at the same time, it's, it gives a message that we're all interlinked and working together in a collaborative manner. And ideas for, you know, this coming uh, celebratory lunch for stress balls, I'm sure Sophie would appreciate that. Um, and, of course, we have external awards um, and Accreditation Canada uh, in the beginning of uh, 2015 had uh, given us a leading practice award for the Head Neck Cancer Survivorship Program, co-led by Jolie Ringash and Maureen McQuestion. And, of course, our very own Mary Gospodero, where are you paying attention? Mary Gospodero, which was <laughs> the recipient of the Officer of the Order of Canada in the, in the summer. Um, and we also have important awards, the Gerald Kirsch Humanitarian Award annually uh, 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 with an endowment from uh, the, Ger the Gerald Kirsch family and our own very senior uh, radiation therapist, Sandra Scott, uh, was the recipient of that along with uh, Patricia Murphy King. But also very importantly, a number of people from our program were also nominated. Tatiana Ritchie and Kevin Lenev, who are two uh, radiation therapists, and John Waldron, who actually has been nominated two years in a row. So I think that all of this uh, speaks to the, uh, the, the quality of the compassionate care that uh, our team delivers uh, for
for our uh, patients constantly. And of course, uh, David Jaffrey uh, was promoted uh, to the EVP of Technology Innovation at UHN, and uh, we're really looking forward to opportunities that will be uh, fantastic for RMP in that context. <clears throat> and also, we've uh, published a lot of uh, high-impact papers, and these are just a few of the samples. Uh, so Sophie and Brian uh, had uh, refined uh, the, uh, the TNM staging system uh, in the context of HPV-positive oral pharyngeal carcinoma. Our uh, collaboration at the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas of uh, Head and Neck Squamous Cell Carcinoma, was published also earlier in the year uh, in uh, Nature. Um, and uh, Porg Ward and uh, Mary Gospoderowicz and many members of our GU site group had the final report of the PR7, which had demonstrated the benefit of androgen deprivation plus radiotherapy for men with locally advanced prostate cancer. And uh, Tony and I also had our luminal A breast cancer work that was uh, published in the JCO uh, in the summer of uh, last year. And uh, Paul Boutros and Rob Bristos, in the effort of the ICGC, had a paper in Nature Genetics, which demonstrated that there was indeed uh, significant uh, uh, tumor heterogeneity in patients with uh, multifocal uh, prostate cancer. And of course, the entire issue of September of the Lancet Oncology Commission was uh, focused on the importance of expanding global access to radiotherapy, and I'm sure that this type of paper will be cited uh, for uh, years to come and will be extremely high impact. We've also been very fortunate to uh, receive external awards, which of course are extremely difficult. Success rate is uh, hovering around 10%. Um, and uh, Laura Dawson, Marianne, and myself were fortunate to have received uh, funding from the uh, CCSRI, ranging from clinical care to basic science and, uh, and radiation fibrosis. <clears throat> and of course, uh, our very own David Jaffrey is exceptionally talented at capturing uh, CFIs. And uh, there was a, a 7.2 dollar CFI in robotic positioning for image-guided surgery and radiation, and another 6.6 .6 million CFI for image-guided discovery laboratory with a number of other uh, investigators and co-investigators from our radiation medicine program. And of course, we're also very fortunate to uh, have extremely innovative people who are able to uh, successfully uh, commercialize their products. And so uh, Daniel Letourneau uh, had to develop the Aqua, which is automated QA system, uh, which is extremely important in terms of being able to ensure uh, QA uh, from uh, machineries and particularly uh, through a complex radiation medicine program. And Caroline Chung and David Jaffrey had also developed a frameless solution uh, to the perfection radiation uh, treatment for patients uh, with brain uh, malignancies. And both of these uh, uh, products were commercialized through Electa. And uh, Mohammed Islam, uh, with his uh, integrated quality monitor, was also uh, commercialized through a uh, technology firm in Germany. And so these commercialization enterprises are extremely important to be able to translate that for the broad application uh, for people and patients around the world. We also have a number of internal awards, and uh, so every year we have a Radiation Medicine Education and Research Award event, and, uh, and we're very fortunate to have recipients of this uh, with our trainees, our many members of our faculty, uh, radiation oncologists, medical physicists, and also, of course, our therapists, and also important to recognize uh, the teams of people who support these types of important activities. And, of course, at the university, uh, we also have... Uh, uh, recipients, uh, we have our residents, or we have our fellows, and we also have uh, a gang, a number of people and trainees who are recipients of a variety of different kinds of innovations uh, and recognizing the importance and the value of uh, effective education. And of course, one of my favorite events that we always uh, celebrate is Halloween. Uh, and, uh, and this year we had a uh, carving contest. So the, the first prize went to the Big Bang uh, Creeps here, which is Really amazing. It looked like a Big Mac, uh, but very, uh, but from a, from a pumpkin. Uh, and the uh, RMP CRP Spooktaculars, which was uh, quite also very innovative. And, a, and another uh, one that I think is really clever and cute is a Spookarella. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I think this is actually gaining a lot of traction around the cancer program. A lot of people outside of RMP walk through these corridors and you know, they're scoring, and, uh, and it's really a lot of fun. Um, and we also have uh, the best uh, male and uh, female uh, costume prices. 
And of course, uh, this wouldn't be happening without the uh, dedication and commitment. Tracy Williams, who, you know, was carting in, you know, her pumpkins uh, over the weekend before Halloween and getting all the teams together. So I think this is a, a really important uh, team building event uh, that... Uh, that's extremely, it's a lot of fun, and, uh, and I think there's a great participation from people uh, within uh, RMP. Now, we've also had some uh, departures and gains. Uh, so Lee Manchel and Mustafa had both uh, retired uh, after uh, dedicating uh, decades uh, to our radiation medicine program. Cynthia Menard uh, had relocated to uh, Quebec, and uh, Sabish had also relocated to the other side, uh, British Columbia. But at the same time, we had also uh, acquired a number of people, uh, in, or retreated people, uh, David Schultz from uh, Stanford, uh, Jen Croak from uh, Newfoundland, and uh, Alejandro Berlin from Santiago, Chile. And we've also recruited a number of other people through uh, various other uh, areas in radiation therapy, uh, administrative assistance, and many more. And uh, so let me now uh, launch into a little bit in terms of describing the strategic priorities in a little bit more detail. Again, precision medicine, integrate research education to clinical practice, strengthening community linkages, and uh, high reliability with system thinking. So the first one is strategic priority number one is to accelerate discover to del discovery to deliver precision medicine for best patient and population outcomes. And so while I'm going through each of this, I'd like each of you within the RMP to think about where you may be able to play roles and where you could engage and email mm -hmm. Katarina. Uh, because we want to be able to build the teams of people. The strategic execution is not going to get done by 12 people uh, at steering. It requires the engagement of all members of our program to be able to effect these, uh, these uh, strategic plans. So within the coming five years, we want to implement a precision medicine approach in at least three tumor site groups. We want to establish the required informatics and data infrastructure because these are petabytes of data that can no longer be managed on Excel uh, spreadsheets. We need to engage our patients more fully in their treatment in evidence generation and gathering. And we need to develop a particle facility in collaboration with our stakeholders at Sick Children's uh, and uh, Cancer Care Ontario and the Ministry of Health. So when we're thinking about precision medicine, uh, this isn't uh, new. This was a, a nice paper uh, from the National Academy of Science back in 2011. And what we really mean here, and as many of you already know, is that we have a lot of clinical observations, which are, of course, critically important. But there's been extensive amounts of biomedical research, and we want to be able to develop this into these massive knowledge networks. So we want to know what the patients have been exposed to in the exposome. Of course, we have our clinical signs and symptoms or a traditional medicine. We are already doing the genomic and the epigenomic uh, profiling. The microbiome is an emerging area of really significant interest in terms of development of, of diseases and cancer and also other types of information. And these massive amounts of, of data are analyzed by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. But what we need to do, of course, is take those high value signals and then be able to validate them on populations. And then you end up developing new taxonomy. So for example, methylation signatures, HER2, of course, is like one of the first examples of that. And, be, and you need to be able to accurately diagnose it. So for example, when Tony and I are talking about luminal A breast cancer, well, how do you actually diagnose that? KI-67 is a biomarker, but is it actually technically reproducible and broadly applicable around the world? There are some challenges with that, but that is absolutely necessary for us to be able to roll that out across populations. And after you have a diagnosis, of course, you ideally you want to develop a targeted treatment that's going to benefit that population of patients. And of course, HER2 and Herceptin are the poster child of that, six, of that success. And then ultimately, it's going to be improving outcome for our patients. And this is a multiple iterative uh, a strategy and tactic that's undertaken by hundreds of groups and thousands of groups around the world currently. So David Jaffrey very nicely articulated this and summarizes in terms of how do we bring this back into the world of radiation medicine. And so currently we're delivering fairly similar regimen of radiation for populations of patients, but we want to be able to take the imaging information, combine that with the genomics data, and then be able to then risk categorize and personalize the treatment for those patients. And the, the, the advantage, of course, that we have within radiation oncology is that we can actually image and we can assay patients 
throughout the courses of the radiation treatment, which lasts several weeks. We know that the tumors change. We know that there are signals which we should be able to capture. And then through image guidance and other uh, assays, for example, liquid biomarker assays throughout the weeks, we should be able to then adapt the treatments in real time and then ultimately improve the outcome for our patients. And so there's a lot of significant work, but I think really exciting potential here that needs to be capitalized. And so one of my favorite uh, uh, efforts that we've participated in is the TCGA. So this is the US-based Lung Cancer Genome Atlas. There's also the ICGC, which is an international consortium. And what's fantastic about these efforts is that these data are completely publicly available. And so there are now more than 1,000 sets of breast cancer uh, samples, the data which have all, all been publicly deposited, along with more than 20 major human malignancies in the head and neck, for example, there are now like 515 uh, samples that have been analyzed. So what kind of data do they have? They've got clinical data, they've got proteomics data, there's microRNA sequencing, methylation, gene expression, copy number, and mutations. And so if you are very much smarter than me, you can access the data through CBAL portal, you can download the data through Firehose, and, what, and you can then develop your own hypothesis. And the beauty of the TCGA and the ICGC efforts is that you can generate your hypothesis using their data, and then you can validate them using your own institutional or other cooperative networks. And alternatively, we generate our own hypotheses from our own institutional data, and then you can validate them using the TCGA. The data are not perfect, but I think that they're exceptionally powerful. Um, and, I, and, and therefore, we need lots and lots of people who can speak these kinds of languages. And we're very fortunate in our uh, environment that we have really uber smart bioinformaticians who love to work with clinicians. And uh, we you know, develop the questions, and then they help us uh, to, uh, to solve those questions uh, and problems. And so let me just take you through a, a, my thinking currently about how we can actually use some of these uh, uh, available tools and resources and give you some examples of that. So I've mentioned the TCGA head and neck data already, and this was published earlier this year, and this is really an encyclopedia of the types of mutations and copy number alterations that are found. Now, the TCGA, unfortunately, we didn't hit any home runs. There were no biomarkers that can really prognosticate effectively for us. But smart people like Scott Bratman and Jeff Bruce, and what they did, of course, is they do a lot of talking between oh. each other. And then the question then that was raised that between the two of them, well, okay, we know that HPV-positive oropharyngeal cancer, what I call the Michael Douglas disease, does very, very well. But not all patients have exactly 100% survival. So what's behind that? And so the question they asked themselves, well, what about the different kinds? Of, there are more than 100 HPV subtypes. And so what they did when they mined the, the TCGA data was they found that if you had HPV 16 here in black, you have a very good survival. But what was surprising was that if you had non-16, so if you had 33, 35, and 56, that these patients actually in red fared as badly as if you had HPV negative OPC. And the important thing here is that we currently are undergoing de-escalation therapy for patients with HPV positive OPC, but nobody's actually paid attention to the specific subtype. And so perhaps if you don't have 16, you may not be it may not be a good idea to be de-escalating therapy. And there also was another publication around the same time that had suggested this may indeed be a biological truth, which means that these are very high-impact observations that really will be changing practice and changing the way that we're thinking about these types of patients. And so this is just one example of how smart groups of people ask interesting questions and mining the massive data can come up with some really, really high impact and practice changing observations. And of course, within the GU and ICGC, uh, Rob Bristow and his uh, international collaborators have uh, made significant uh, stride in the same area. So what they have done was they had analyzed uh, blocks of biopsies of patients with intermediate grade prostate cancer and had, the, so on the green here, these are the chromosomes on the green to the left are losses and in the red are to the right are the gains. 
And what they found was that they can quantitate this kind of genomic aberration through a value that they call the percent genome alteration or the PGA. And so you can have really, really quiet, almost normal genome with a score of 0.09, or you can have an exceptionally aberrant genome with a score of up to 36%. And then what they also did, of course, was publish a landmark paper in uh, December uh, 2014 in Lancet Oncology, which uh, was, it wasn't just a genomic aberration that was important, but in fact it was the combination of the genomic aberration along with tumor hypoxia, and that actually portended the worst prognosis, and this is for patients, for all the patients, and for the patients managed with radiotherapy only. And so what they're rolling out now is a Matador trial, which is asking and testing whether or not the PGA, along with the hypoxia, can really be utilized to then randomize patients between standard treatment and neoadjuvant molecular targeted therapies. And so I think this is the type of world that we want to definitely be extending beyond just prostate cancer to be really asking how this type of genomic information can be made to be capitalized to benefit patients uh, uh, within our program and beyond. And another area that I think is really, really powerful, and we have a huge opportunity to really uh, uh, capitalize on, is the world of radio genomics. And so this is the question of how do we use the imaging data that we do routinely for staging as part of, of, of a routine clinical practice, and can we use that data? And also, as we're it repeatedly imaging these patients throughout their course of radiotherapy, how do we combine that and how do we use that information to really help our patients? And so this was landmark work that was conducted uh, by Hugo Ertz, uh, and this is a collaboration between the Farber and the Maastricht in the Netherlands, where they started out with 440 features of CTs of the thoraces from 422 patients with non-small cell lung cancer. And, then they just, and so similar to the genomic information, they then distilled it down to four variables or characteristics, tumor intensity, shape, texture, and wavelet. And what they have found was that they were able to dichotomize and predict risk. And they validated on another two, more than 200 patients with lung cancer and head neck cancer. And so on the left-hand side here, you can see that they were able to dichotomize the outcome between a low-risk feature, a pattern feature, and a high risk in lung cancer. But what was also interesting and more interesting, if you, if you really think about it, is that these data actually seem to perform more robustly in patients with head neck cancer. And so there was also some association with gene expression data, but I think that we have a huge opportunity whereby we have well-defined cohorts of patients, we, we conduct the next-gen sequencing and all the copy number variations and RNA seek these patients' tumors, and then we correlate that with the, uh, the imaging data. And it's not just, this has just been developed for CT, but where is the world when it comes to MRs? And we can do that over, long, over a, a length of time, um, and I think that we really have the uh, significant opportunity to be able to uh, move this for, um, field forward significantly. <laughs> And then there's also then the circulating biomarkers, and, uh, and the circulating cell-free uh, tumor DNA is just one of them that can be assayed. And these are data that you've seen previously where when Scott Bratman was a, a resident at Stanford working in Mac Dean's lab, they were able to develop a very super sensitive method by which they can assay uh, circulating tumor DNA in patients with lung cancer. And you can see here that after surgical resection that the, uh, the, the circulating tumor DNA is no longer detectable. And it's also useful in the context of SBRT for lung cancer. And in particular here, if you're using uh, imaging uh, methods, you would be assaying, determining this patient still might have some residual disease. But if you look at the, uh, the CT DNA, it was actually undetectable. And I think this is also another method and, and strategy that could be useful for distinguishing uh, radiation fibrosis and versus residual disease. And so this technique, of course, we have because we have Scott Bratman in our midst here, and, uh, and, and then this is, again, something that can be assayed longitudinally over treatment, uh, over the weeks of treatment, theoretically, and also in the month after uh, treatment has been completed. And then, of course, we have the power of the adaptive radiation therapy. And these slides I had borrowed from uh, Jean-Pierre Bissonnette when they gave an excellent talk uh, here a couple of months ago. And, and, and we're in this world uh, of adaptive precision radiation, but there are a lot of opportunities for questions about should we be adapting for our patients? 
Uh, when do we adapt? Do we adapt after the first week of treatment or do we adapt in the last week of treatment? And how <coughs> exactly do we adapt? And who would be the patient population who would benefit the most from adaptation? And after we've got this figured out, how much does this cost? And how do we roll that out in a financially uh, and economically sustainable manner? And so here an example, patients with lung cancer at week zero, obviously there's a very large mass in this patient's lung. And then, but as, as you predict, uh, as we proceed through the seven weeks of radiotherapy, the tumor mass is almost shrunk down to undetectable. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to be irradiating and delivering the same volume uh, for these patients. And so this type of uh, change obviously really brings into the question of adapting. And so Vicky Kahn has been working uh, really uh, hard here. Uh, so in here in the solid green here is a reference bladder outline uh, at the time of the planning CT. But during this particular fraction of treatment, using the cone beam CT, we can see that the bladder and the rectum are no longer the same as at the time of the initial planning. And so then taking the deformable registration, then there is another sort of uh, DVH that can be generated. And you can see that during this fraction, the dose of, this is theoretical, the dose being delivered then to the revised or amended or moved uh, bladder and the rectum here is much lower. And so if you can accumulate this over seven weeks or 35 treatments, then you really should be delivering much less dose to the normal tissues. And so this should be theoretically deriving then an improved therapeutic ratio. The tumor still receives the same dose, but you're reducing now the dose to the normal tissues. So, so this makes sense, but how does this actually play out and how do we figure out, and, and this completely changes our workflow, of course, in thinking about this. And of course, we have our MRGRT suite that's finally coming up online, yay. So we have the bracket therapy where we've had more than 200 patients uh, with our gynae group in particular who've undergone the, uh, the bracket therapy. And the MR itself is also now uh, very nicely uh, acting, uh, acting in, in terms of servicing. And so a number of patients with uh, prostate uh, bracket therapy have been treated here. And then our external beam linear accelerator will be coming along line uh, soon. And so the question here is how do we utilize this particular technology, which is the only one in the world, by the way, where you can actually do near real time imaging and who are the patients again who would benefit the most and how again do we adapt our workflow uh, to make this uh, come to fruition and fully capitalize and understand its uh, its value. And Mike Sharp and Dave Hodgson have also uh, been leading, co-leading the efforts on developing a business uh, plan which we have completed just at the end of last year uh, and we're also uh, going to be pushing this at the CEO levels and so we've been encouraging our uh, Michael Apcon at CEO of Sick Kids and our Peter Pisters here, CEO here at UHN to get together and then talk to Cancer Care Ontario and talk to MOH and, and really pushing the high energy particle therapy um, agenda, which I think is ultimately extremely important because we want to be delivering the uh, highest quality of clinical care for our patients, uh, children and adults alike. And so just putting all that together, this was a nicely schema here uh, in uh, last year, uh, in 2014, uh, where we take, we basically, we, we analyze and dissect each patient's tumor uh, in the maximum way possible. Uh, they're also implanting these patients' tumors into immune-compromised mice so that we can understand the, uh, the proliferation, the cancer stem cell concept, and also perhaps uh, looking at novel therapeutics uh, in this context. We want to be able to assay these uh, deeply and to understand them and ultimately then to develop the high value signatures that I've talked about. That's going to be able to predict the response, resistance, and whether toxicity will develop and ultimately to develop the personalized uh, treatment. And the way that I'm thinking about, again, uh, put, translating this in the context of precision radiation is that what we really like to be able to develop is a four-dimensional mapping and modeling of the patient's tumor. So we know, and we all think in a three dimension, we know that there is clonality, which creates challenges. Um, and we know that, for example, the issue of the, the stem cells, which is in, a, in some ways a related uh, question. And so how do we visualize that? And how do we see that in each patient at the time, at the beginning of their treatment? And then using imaging tools and also the, the liquid biopsies, 
over time, which is the fourth dimension, we want to be able to really understand and, and, and be able to then target that uh, for the individual patient. And so, you know, we're doing that now with the, the, the PET CTs in terms of metabolic le regions or hypoxic <coughs> regions. But if we could, in, if we could visualize the, the tumor stem cells, if we can visualize the clonality and be able to map that, I think that would be incredibly powerful. Um, and so that's where I would really like to think about uh, in, in, in the, in the, within the coming five years and develop that for our uh, patients. So the second strategic priority number two is to capture, store, and share integrated patient data for every patient. They intensify the research impact, and again, we're challenging our, our groups here to be thinking about what are the clinically transformational questions, and then to study those cohorts in depth, as I've just illustrated, and then really transform the way we think about how to manage our patients. We want to be able to translate our, our data into uh, sustainable educational offerings, and obviously we were aligning our staff performance goals with these very important um, uh, academic mandates. So I'd just like to quickly describe a little bit about the Accelerated Education Program, which was the brainchild of Mary, David, and Pam uh, 10 years ago, um, and then this was executed by Nicole and David, and David Wolger has moved on to uh, CAMH. But over the last 10 years, there have been significant uh, uh, energy in this area. We've had more than 1,200 attendees uh, who have come on site to attend uh, these many courses. There have been 24 Foundations of Image Guidance courses, nine site-specific IGRT courses. The most recent one was the oligometastasis one. Five IMRT, four quality and safety, and two accelerate technology courses. And these uh, individuals come from all around the world. Uh, we have uh, attendees coming from as far as Australia, New Zealand, uh, many parts of Asia, many from Western Europe, South America, and obviously the, the bulk of the, our, our attendees are coming from North America for geographic uh, proximity reasons. And as a result of that, we've actually built a lot of expertise uh, within and assets within our own program. We have a core group of educational experts within radiation medicine, and many of them, of course, win awards uh, because, because each of these uh, deliverers actually are scored by the attendees. Um, and we have a track record, obviously, for effective and successful delivery. And we've developed a lot of innovative tools and assets uh, with interactive learning classrooms, Cisco show and share, and e-learning development and animation developments that are assets for ourselves and also ones that we can share uh, around the world. And uh, Meredith and uh, Caitlin, along with Nicole, have also developed a lot of e-learning modules uh, ranging from uh, breast cancer to head and neck uh, and lymphomas, and there are also several that are in progress and near completion. And so the idea is that these e-learning modules and are modules that then can, again, be utilized within our program and also uh, shared and disseminated around the world. And so the way that we're thinking about our educational assets and how we uh, plan to roll that out and are rolling it out is that obviously we build a lot of assets uh, with and for our trainees. We have these modules that are web-based, and some of these, and many of them, we want to be able to share that on iPhones with our users around the world. Um, and we have these on-site courses that I've described to you, and then at the very sort of the apex, if you will, of our uh, educational program are the personalized learning plans, which are very, very intense. Six months is almost like a, an executive uh, radiation oncology immersion, um, and, uh, mm -hmm. and they have uh, in-depth in uh, mentorship uh, with our senior faculty, observers, uh, learning modules, and then tutorials. And so our first uh, two uh, attendees for this uh, last year were Drs. Wu and Liu, uh, who uh, come from uh, PUMC, the uh, Beijing Union Medical College, which is one of the top uh, cancer centers in China. And, uh, and they were extremely appreciative. And in fact, Dr. Wu just emailed us recently to say that he's been promoted and is now uh, actually now in charge of head and neck cancer. And we're, so we're hoping that the, the learnings uh, and the offerings that we have here, our culture of quality and safety and the interprofessionalism of our environment is something that can be then translated across the world. This is kind of you know slow uh, and, and, and small, but we're hoping that ultimately this will be able to disseminate across the world uh, in a very intense way. 
So strategic priority number three is to strengthen internal and external community linkages. Um, I think RMP is pretty close to an employer of choice, but we want to be able to obviously continue and enhance that. We want to in enhance the integration and collaboration within UHN. UHN, as you all know, is a very large and complex organization, and there are several research institutes across our environment, um, and there are um, thousands of, of physicians and, uh, and, and allied healthcare team, and we need to make sure that everybody's working uh, in very closely and harmonized. We improve continuity of care. There are always opportunities uh, for improvement. We don't want patients to be falling through the cracks, particularly when they have their trimodality care that are uh, across different uh, organizations or even within the cancer program. Um, and obviously, we want to be able to optimize access to cancer patients uh, locally, uh, nationally, and also globally. So we have a lot of community linkages, and, uh, and these are just a few of the examples of individuals who are playing important leadership roles within Cancer Care Ontario, and there are a lot more within our program. Um, and, and when I meet with Michael Shearer, the CEO of Cancer Care Ontario, on a regular basis, he's extremely complimentary and very grateful for the participation of people from Radiation Medicine Program at the Princess Margaret and, and our, our um, generosity in disseminating and sharing our best practices across the, the province. And he understands and is very supportive of the fact that a lot of the innovation comes from uh, the center. We have uh, the Connections uh, newsletter, which we publish about three times a year. Um, and, uh, and what we here do is we illustrate and highlight specific programs, and, um, and we disseminate this across 2,000 of our referring uh, physicians. And this could be uh, general practitioners to other oncologists and surgeons, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and we've uh, now modified that we're no longer uh, mailing them, and so we're turning this into a digital era for both environmental and uh, cost reasons. Um, and of course, we have a lot of uh, outreach uh, with uh, MCCs, with our Lynn partners at St. Mike's and St. Joe's, and along with clinics that are run in both of these uh, hospitals. And I'm very grateful for our oncology uh, members who go out to uh, these uh, places, which I think is extremely important. And of course, we have continuing medical education offerings, both uh, internally and also uh, externally. And in fact, uh, last April, uh, we had an evening, a CME evening, with our uh, colleagues at both St. Mike's and St. Joe's. And one of the best parts of that evening was finally putting a face to the email at the other end when, you know, emailing for decades uh, over uh, shared patients. And, and, they, and the feedback was fantastic. Uh, and I think that they're hoping and anticipating that we'll be holding another similar event this year. And of course, our global outreach is extremely important, and Mary Gospodarowicz in her capacity uh, as the uh, past president of UICC has been ex uh, instrumental and high impact in that regard. And I think that has also inspired a lot of other people within the program to be reaching out globally. And so some of the activities, for example, Rebecca Wan and Horio Volpe have been very active in Ghana in uh, developing uh, research modules uh, for uh, the folks uh, in Accra. And Tony and uh, Mike Milosevic and many others within our program have also been collaborating with uh, the folks in uh, uh, Eldorado, Kenya, through the AMPATH, which was first developed by University of Indiana initially for HIV, but much of their activity now, of course, is also focused on cancer. And we're also hoping to launch and develop a collaboration with Ethiopia. So the University of Toronto with uh, Addis Ababa uh, have actually a 10-year relationship, which was first uh, developed uh, from the, for the training of psychiatry uh, and pretty well emerged medicine, med uh, hematology, surgery, dentistry. It's all being rolled out. And last year, they had to approach us with training of radiation medicine uh, personnel. And we certainly will be hoping to launch that and, and figuring out how to roll that out over the uh, coming year. Now, of course, we spend a lot of our time in the print media, uh, and, uh, but, but we're also in the social media. And so uh, Emma Ito had uh, uh, developed a, a quick start, uh, which is on YouTube. They can uh, go and click on that. And this really is describing our award-winning quick start program, where because of the uh, algorithm that Tom Purdy had developed, and this was the founders of this, was Tony Files and uh, Grace Lee, along with Tom Purdy, um, where a patient could be seen at 9 o'clock in the morning and start her breast radiotherapy at 2 o'clock this afternoon. And so I think this is extremely important and beneficial, and we currently are the only group <coughs> in the world that can offer this uh, program. And we do 
have this uh, Twitter handle. And so last week I had emailed everybody within Radiation Medicine that we have to populate this with stories. Uh, and uh, so Jasmine Hamilton, who is covering Emma Ito's uh, maternity leave, is going to be uh, posting this uh, on, uh, on Twitter, and so I think this is a uh, kind of a fun thing to do to build our brand and do. And we have interesting followers ranging from you know educators to patients to uh, to trainees to uh, other cancer centers and uh, foundations. Uh, and so I think it's a it's a it's, it's it's a large broad audience. The last strategic priority is uh, extend high reliability with systems thinking. We want to establish a fully functioning dashboard that supports an integrated decision making across radiation medicine. And we want to be able to obviously continue to enhance and add the quality concepts into everything that we do operationally. And at the end of the day, we need to streamline our decision making and clarify the accountability. And so the, this, the slides I had actually presented a few years ago uh, with, the, it, with the concept of the high reliability organization. So you can have two different models of this precluded event model, which is probably more applicable to a nuclear power uh, uh, plant. Uh, the resilience model is probably something that's more similar to a healthcare organization where the inputs, if you will, are extremely variable. There are some very complex, but many of them are all, can be very standardized, and we need to be able to respond in real time. And so, as you know, the pathway for patients within radiation medicine is relatively straightforward. We make a decision that we're going to deliver treatment. The patients then come down to our planning um, CT, have a plan that's generated, that's then QA, and then the treatment itself is delivered. But every single step, of course, from the entry to the exit, we need to be seeking opportunities for improvement so that we can have uh, excellence uh, in the delivery. And so we want to be able to develop the operational efficiency for patient care. And so in 2013, I had established the PERM-T, the Performance Excellence in Radiation Medicine team. And this was co-led with John Kim, Shannon Pearson, and Tom Purdy, supported by Payam Zahedi at the time. And we were very fortunate that we were able to get pro bono advice from Brian Silverman, who is a prof at, uh, from the Rotman School of Management. And they took a deep dive uh, into the way that we operate within RMP, and there were four pillars of activities that they recommended. One is to move ourselves into an HRO. Number two is that we need to be reorganizing our committee and management structure. We need to, at the time when I started my job in 2012, our uh, referral was actually declining, and so we need to develop some strategies to improve the patient referral, and we also need to improve the physical space environment for our folks in RMP. So number three, we don't need to worry about. Our numbers are steadily going up, um, and so we can say, yes, check that off. But I think that the other three, uh, there are still opportunities uh, for improvement. And that's one of the things, one of the many uh, pillars that we want to roll out for our final strategic uh, uh, priority. And so Daniel uh, Letourneau has been fantastic in working through the developing a dashboard. Um, and here uh, is, for example, the number of courses that was delivered in 2014-15 in green here. In, and this is from weeks 1 to 52, which is April the 1st to March the 31st. Um, and you can see that generally in the summer, not that cancer doesn't get diagnosed in the summer, but our surgeons, <coughs> and, uh, I guess, go on a holidays. And so that usually in the summer, it, it, it goes down. But you can see here that the data in 2015, however, is uh, not the same. And so this is where it's a complex uh, predictability. Um, and our numbers were actually constantly increasing, as we've described, but we seem to be slowing down uh, just a little bit, uh, which is okay. Um, and, uh, but, but again, I mean, where I would really like to be able to get to is that uh, if on Jan in the first week of January, we have our case mix of the consult in terms of the diagnoses. We should be able to predict the number of courses of radiotherapy that's going to be delivered over a period of time in the coming few months. And so that, again, is modeling. And we've got, you know, five years of data at least that we can figure that out. I don't think it should be that complicated, but I think it's really important for us to understand that so we could be deploying our resources appropriately so that all of our planners and our units are right-sized, if you will, are appropriately uh, staffed um, so that we have consistent practice uh, through the, the program. Um, and, but it is complex. 
but it can't be any harder than genomic data, I'm figuring, right? So uh, anyway, so, so that's where I think we really need to uh, get to. So again, uh, the strategic priorities, precision medicine, integrate research education into <coughs> clinical practice, strengthen community linkages, and extend high reliability with systems thinking. And so uh, a number of year one priorities, um, accelerate discovery to deliver precision medicine. We want to establish a shared understanding. This is now this coming year. We're now just starting this year here in the meaning and scope of precision medicine. Implement an adaptive radiation treatment strategy. Strengthen partnerships with research institutes and clinicians within UHN and beyond. Expand patient engagement strategies. Develop a business case for a, patient, for a particle therapy facility. Advance precision medicine by leveraging gains from the MR guided brachytherapy program. Number two, we want to refine point of care data capture processes, establish site group research mandate and plan, establish a growth plan and business model for our continuing education offerings, facilitate staff access to UHN wellness and development programs, monitor catchment areas for gaps and opportunities to enhance access to care, revisit our RMP brand to enhance our visibility within the LIN, the province and beyond. Establish KPIs and operational metrics to promote shared ownership across our program. Review our committee structure to optimize accountability and alignment with priorities and enhance RMP capacity and capability for quality improvement and project management. And so with each of these areas and buckets of activities, we want to be able to roll this out starting this year. Uh, and we need to engage everyone in this process uh, because we need all 350 people on board, as it were. Now, we're balanced by the fiscal reality here. The provincial budget uh, expends $50 billion a year on health care. The demand for this expenditure is increasing at about 7% per year. Our economic growth within the province is about 2% per year, an increasing gap. And we have the reality that there's a $12.5 billion annual deficit within the program, uh, within the province, not the program. The program is doing extremely well, Marnie. Don't worry. <laughs> and so we need to stop the wastage or reduce the wastage and learn from every opportunity and to figure out how do we develop, deliver care at a lower cost. And so coming back to the Lumino A story that you've heard before, and uh, Tony Files had uh, launched this and published uh, this uh, landmark paper with, whereby half the patients with favorable uh, or low-risk breast cancer did not have radiotherapy. And what we found th recently, of course, is that the group of patients who have the lowest risk luminal A <laughs> breast cancer, there was really uh, no benefit from breast radiotherapy. And so now across the country, there is a Lumina A, Lumina prospective study where we, if you fulfill these criteria for low risk breast cancer, we are withholding breast radiotherapy. And, the, and Kathy Hahn had led this economic analysis and demonstrated that if we rule this out as standard of care, this will save the province $2 million a year every single year going forward, about $5 million across the country here in Canada, and this is a conservative estimate. And so this shows that you have decades of research and that it does pan out into an economic benefit for society, for our system, and of course for the individual patient who then no longer needs to undergo unnecessary treatment. And so I think this is the first example of a personalized radiation medicine approach and we want to be able to roll this out as broadly across the program uh, for our own patients across the country, across the province, and across the world. And of course the e-technology, we need to figure this out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was actually lots of people are figuring this out. This was actually a conference back in 2012 about this. And so I think, again, Radiation Medicine Program has a huge opportunity on um, following patients at home and doing consultations. And Rebecca Wan and, and teams uh, led with her had actually been doing that in terms of remote consultation. We can do the wearables, you know, you can actually access <coughs> anything. I found out recently so that you can wear something and it can actually measure your uh, pulmonary arterial pressure. Uh, and, uh, and then using the smart apps, uh, we could do this in a much more efficient way. And so I borrowed this slide from Peter Pisters, and that is that at the Princess Margaret here, 
we do the, the hard work here on understanding the genomics and the panomics of patients' tumors. We do the diagnostics, we do the staging, and we plan the treatments, and then we deliver them in our, in our GRT suite here. Did you see this, Mike? Um, and then you receive your treatment here, but if you don't need to be followed at the Princess Margaret, why don't we just follow you at home and then come back on an intermittent basis uh, when it's necessary. And I think that this would be uh, an extremely important way for us to be moving forward. But we have to figure out who are the patients who are amenable to this type of uh, distant uh, follow-up and, and how do we make sure that their outcome is the same, if not better, and then what is the actual saving to the healthcare system. And our responsibility is to be designing them and then evaluating them and then rolling them out in a sustainable manner. So in conclusion, our vision, precision radiation medicine, personalized care, global impact, our mission, advanced exemplary radiation medicine through patient care, research and education in partnership with patients and community, these are the four strategic priorities I've already articulated, and we're anchored by the five important values that guide in everything on all of our activities every single day. Now, this could seem to be a daunting task, but it's not. This is highly achievable. And why is that? The reason is because our people, our most important resource is a huge talent that we have within radiation medicine. We have the money. We have our amazing team of our Princess Market Cancer Foundation. I know that Paul's a little bit nervous with the you know, Dow Jones, but that's okay. It's temporary. Um, and very importantly, we have space. We're moving into the OPG uh, at the end of this year, and so there will be creating creation of space that's going to be able to allow us to undertake a lot of these types of innovative practices. And we have very, very supportive leadership, Peter Pisters, Mary Gospodarowicz, and Marty Eskoff. Um, and at the end of the day, everyone in RMP has a role to play in advancing our vision, in pushing this, these four priorities, uh, and we'll be able to really execute, uh, I think, very, very successfully. And every day, the reason we get up every morning is that we're looking after our patients. And so thank you very much. And so I'll be happy to